Today's passage is from the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. Galatians 2, 11 through 16. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in the hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it, then, that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth are not Gentile sinners. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because observing, by observing the law, no one will be justified. What is the toughest part about high school. I thought about this this week. I started thinking, what was the biggest challenge? Was it classes? I don't know. I, I remember at the time kind of struggling with a few classes, but that's not a struggle that stayed with me. I, I've gotten over that, so I, I don't think that was the biggest struggle. Maybe it's something simple. Maybe it's just finding your way around. It, it's a new place. It's a big building. I remember my high school that I went to was larger. We had a science wing and a math wing and an English wing, and they remodeled the building twice while I was in school. So I got lost. A lot. That's probably not my biggest challenge. One of the high school students this week in our church told me that the biggest challenge was balance. I was finding a balance between studies and sports and extracurriculars and a job if you have one. And I get that. I, mean, I still got to struggle with balance sometimes. So I, maybe that's it. So I think, looking back, the biggest struggle I had in high school was finding a place to sit during lunch. That's, <laughs> that was difficult. Every teen movie I've ever seen in all history tells us that where you sit in the lunchroom tells people everything they need to know about your social status. Now, my challenge was a little stranger. I had a group of about 10 friends, and our high school had eight seats at a table. So figuring out where we were going to sit was tougher than my trigonometry class. Today's passage teaches us that high school never ends. Because the challenge of today's passage is where people would sit during lunch. Really. I mean, it's more than that, but that's where it all started. Where, where are people going to find a place to sit? Are they sitting with a football star and the head cheerleader, or are they sitting with a debate team? Guess which one of those I sit with. That's really where this, pro this problem starts, though. Where are people going to eat? Let me start by resetting the scene. Paul had established a church in Galatia when he had first traveled on his first missionary journey. They left the area, and a little while later, some Jews from Jerusalem came. And they started preaching a different gospel. They started preaching what Paul said was not really a gospel at all. They said that to be saved, a person had to keep all the Old Testament laws and rules. We call these people Judaizers because they taught that to be a real Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you needed to keep all the laws and customs of Judaism at that time. And this group really did not like Paul. They did not like the fact that Paul was preaching a gospel of salvation by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They did not like that Paul was claiming to be an apostle. They attacked him. Last week, we talked about how they said that Paul wasn't really an apostle because he wasn't one of the original 12, and he wasn't from Jerusalem. And we looked at how Paul overcame that attack by the word of his testimony. Today these Judaizers have a different attack against Paul. They say, again, he's not an apostle because they bring up a story about how Paul got into a fight with Peter, the leader of the apostles. And the unstated 
assumption is that if Paul was fighting with the leader of the apostles, then he couldn't really be an apostle himself. Like last week, I think, if we just look at this on the surface, if we don't really think about it, then I can see where that attack is coming from. But when we look a little deeper, we see a very different story. Because Paul took this same story that these Judaizers had used against him, and he turned it around to be a lesson about how we should live in Jesus Christ. So, the problem all started in Antioch. Now, Antioch was sort of like Paul's home church. After every missionary journey, he went back to Antioch. He reported on what he was doing, and the church in Antioch provided him financial support to go out and preach the gospel. And it seemed at some point that Peter had visited Antioch, which was about 150 miles north of Jerusalem. And when Peter came to visit, he visited with the Christians in Antioch. He ate with them, he talked with them, he spent time with them, he just hung out with them. Simple enough. But then, some Jews from Jerusalem came. And when they showed up, Peter stopped eating with the Gentile Christians and only ate with the Jewish Christians. Now, before I get too deep into that, I do want to give Peter a little grace. I don't want to be too hard on him here because I don't think Peter had any malice in this. I don't think he was trying to hurt people. This is probably more of a habit. Let me tell you a story. When Leanne and I first got married, we got our first apartment, and we agreed not to wear our shoes in the apartment. That was how Leanne grew up. They always took their shoes off and they went in the house. It keeps the place cleaner. Okay, sure, I agree to that. In my house, we never did that when I was a kid. We just left our shoes on, but it wasn't a big deal to me. So we agreed not to take our shoes off. Or to, to, to take our shoes off. But I spent my entire life just wearing my shoes into the house. And for a long time, I would forget to take my shoes off. That just drove Leanne crazy. And I did not get up in the morning and think, how can I drive Leanne crazy today? <laughs> I mean, okay, I grant that's the kind of thing I might do, but I wasn't doing that. I just forgot. It was a habit for me to leave my shoes on, so I kept doing it. And I think that's what was happening with Peter. It was a habit. Peter did not sit down and think, how can I make life harder for Gentile Christians? More likely, this was just a habit. Whenever there were Jews around, Peter ate only with the Jews. He did it without thinking about it. This was his habit. However, while this was just a habit for Peter, it was also a really big deal. Because by not eating with the Gentile Christians, Peter was making a statement about who is and who is not a real Christian. In effect, Peter was saying to these Gentile Christians, sure, you're a Christian, I just don't want to be seen with you. I'm not going to eat at the table with you. He was going to go over to the cool kids' table. Peter may not have been intending to do this, but he was making a statement about who was and who was not a Christian. And so Paul opposed him. Paul said that he publicly told Peter that what he was doing was wrong. And Paul wrote in Galatians, I do it again. Paul would not let this go. For Peter had been preaching a gospel of salvation by the grace of God. He'd been telling people that anyone can turn to the Lord. No matter how we were born, no matter what we've done, no matter how we've lived, anyone can turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. He wasn't living like that. Paul knew that both Paul and Peter had the truth. Paul wanted Peter to start living like it. Well, this may have been a habit for Peter. He needed to examine his habits. He needed to put his entire life under the microscope to conform himself to Jesus Christ. And Peter agreed. After Paul confronted him. Peter realized what he was doing was wrong, and he started eating with the Gentile Christians again. The Judaizers had brought this story up as an attack against Paul, to say he's not really an apostle, because he opposed the leader of the apostles. Paul turned this around to point out that he is a true apostle, because even Peter, 
the leader of the apostles listen to him. Okay, I mean, that's great, but maybe you're sitting there right now, now thinking, all right, Brian, but what's the point? What's that got to do with us today? I, mean, I don't think anyone in the room right now is questioning if Paul was an apostle or not. I think we've settled that matter. But I do think this passage has some meaning for us today. There are, there are two lessons that we can gain from this passage. Because there's a lesson in the fact that Paul opposed Peter, and there's a lesson in the reason that Paul opposed Peter. First, there is a lesson in the mere fact that Paul was willing to oppose Peter. Because this is the same Paul who wrote, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you. This is the same Paul who wrote, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of love. This is the same Paul who wrote, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Paul cared about the unity of the church. He did not want us to live in opposition to other Christians. And yet, Paul opposed Peter. We know how this story ends, but if we didn't, this would be a really tense moment in the history of the church. If Peter had lacked humility, if Peter had insisted that what he was doing was right, I have no idea how the history of the church would have gone. We know that didn't happen. Peter recognized his mistake and he repented, but for Paul, it was ri worth risking the unity of the church. Because as much as Paul cared about the unity of the church, he cared more about the mission of the church. He would not sacrifice the truth, the, the gospel of salvation for all people. So here's my question for you today. What hill would you die on? What is a truth for you that is so important you would risk the unity of the church. Yeah, there's a lot of things that Christians can disagree about. We can disagree about a lot of theological issues. We can disagree about election versus free will or the meaning of various visions of the Bible. We can disagree about style, about if we should have different styles of music, if we should have mainly traditional hymns or focus on contemporary worship or if we should have a blended service of both. We could disagree about the style of the Lord's Supper, if we should have grape juice or wine, if we should have unleavened bread or bread with yeast in it, if we should pass the plate around or have everybody come to the front to take from the cup and bread. We can disagree about practical things. We can disagree about the organizational style of the church or the role of women in leadership in the church or if we should focus on supporting local missions versus sending people overseas to spread the gospel. And I'm not saying that any of those things are unimportant. They are all genuinely important issues, and I have my own view on each of them. But I also recognize that none of those, for me, is a hill that I'm going to die on. Someone else can disagree with me and be okay with that. I can agree to disagree and still consider us one in Christ, one in spirit and in love. But there are hills I'll die on. There are some truths that are so important I will not back down no matter what. I'm not going to get into what those are right now because the real question is, what hill will you die on? What are the truths that are so important to you that you would even risk the unity of the church for them? I can't draw that line for you. I mean, don't even know it would be a lot easier if I could. It would be great if I could just tell you where your line is and everybody has to agree with me. That doesn't work. You have to draw that line yourself. So do that. Know the truths that matter so much to you that you would not back down on them. Know the hill that you would die on. Know that the truth that is so important is worth risking the unity of the church. And know that everything else is less important than the unity of the church. We live in a Society where people just jump from church to church like it's nothing. But if you've got the truth, 
If you're going to hold to a truth that you don't die on, then recognize that everything else is not you know, worth dying on. Recognize what matters so much you won't back down from, and recognize what is less important than the unity of the church. And I think, really, that leads us into the second lesson we can gain from today's passage. The first best lesson is the fact that there is something that Paul would say, this is a hill I'll die on. The second lesson is what that specific issue was. Because for Paul, the hill that he would die on was the inclusion of all believers. That anyone who turns to God in faith would be saved. That anyone who confesses with his mouth and believes with his heart that Jesus Christ is Lord will be saved. That he would not exclude anyone from the faith. So, I think that leads us to the obvious question, is there someone you would exclude? And we are talking about committed believers here. We are talking about people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and accepted him as, as Lord. Is there a line you're drawing in your life? Is there someone you're saying, yeah, sure, they're Christians, I just don't want to be seen with them? Do you have a divide? Maybe it's a political divide. Our nation is more politically divided than it has been since the Civil War. A survey last week found that 70%, or excuse me, a little more than 90% of Republicans say that the greatest danger to America is Democrats. Same survey found that a little more than 90% of Democrats I think the greatest danger to America is Republicans. Now, obviously this leaves out half the country that doesn't identify with either party, but for nearly half of our country, the greatest danger, the thing they are most afraid of is their neighbors. Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, mind, strength, and soul. And the second is like it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we approach our neighbors, the way this world does, if we look at our neighbors as our enemy, instead of those whom we love, then we're not really the church. Because we are called to love beyond the ways of this world. Maybe you have a different line. Maybe your divide would be a racial or a national divide. I don't think this is popular anymore, but there was a time when many people said that America was a chosen nation, the people set apart from God. But any gospel that is true in America and not true in Syria is not a true gospel. If we are to love the way God has loved us, it means we show love and care for all people, regardless of the color of skin, regardless of what nation they were born in. We are called to love. Maybe it's a different line. Maybe for you the line is an economic line. I I remember once I was working in a homeless shelter, excuse me, a soup kitchen. We were serving food to people in the community who were either homeless or who had a home, but they were in a situation where they had to choose between paying rent or buying groceries. And so we were giving out food, and there was a woman there. I'm going to call her Jane. And Jane, on the whole, was a very kind nice, she was fun to work with, she was the kind of person who would give up her evening to go serve food to people who were hungry. But she wouldn't eat with them. After we were done serving, after we had prepared all the food and everyone had come through the line, gotten their food, then the servers would all get their food and go out and sit with the people who had just come through and talk with them and eat with them. Except for Jane. She always ate her meal in the kitchen away from everybody else. I had never asked Jane about this. Maybe she had a reason for doing this that I don't know about. But the appearance it gave was that she would give food to someone who was hungry, but she wouldn't sit with them. She wouldn't eat with them. Where's your line? Maybe it's something else entirely. But in your life, is there some group, is there some ways that someone is born, some group in society that you say, well, you know, sure, they're Christians as long as I don't have to be around them. So I don't have to actually show direct love to them. Peter fell into that trap. Peter, the apostle, fell into that trap of only sitting with the Jewish Christians, not the Gentile Christians. 
And I think sometimes a lot of us will fall into that trap today. But we are called to love. I began this sermon by talking about finding a seat in the cafeteria. And again, every movie about teenagers ever made tells us that where you sit tells you everything you need to know about your social status. Now, that's a movie. So it's silly and funny and kind of a shortcut for mediocre writing. In real life, it can be a statement about who we think counts in God's sight. Jesus Christ has died for us. He has taken away all of our sins. If you have turned your life over to him, you are welcome. You have a seat at the table. Now our job is to make sure that we are not excluding anyone else from that table. In a moment, we're going to stand for our invitation hymn. And as we stand to sing, if, if you've been looking at your life saying, I have been excluding somebody, I've been looking down on this group, I've been saying, sure, you're Christians as long as you stay over there, and you need to change, you have that opportunity. Or perhaps... You haven't taken your seat at the table yet. Perhaps you haven't yet accepted the grace of the God who loves you beyond measure. If not, you have that chance. You have an opportunity for the God who desires your salvation. As you'll stand with me now for our invitation hymn, which is Lead to Me to Calvary, number 176, and we'll sing all the verses. Mm -hmm.